All right, cool. Well, thank you everyone for coming on this beautiful day. Um, here, I'll fade out the music. <laughs> uh, so welcome to our Making Meaning in Your Community session for Local Champions. And um, today we have an interesting session. We have a bunch of amazing guests who are going to tell us a little bit about their work with their communities. Um, and then we are going to do a little Q&A. Um, and then really we're gonna test out using some breakout rooms where we'll roll up our sleeves and actually do some brainstorming about ways that you could work with your communities um, that are relevant to the Climate Smart Communities Program. So um, what I would like to do first is just introduce our guests and then we're gonna have them go and each give about 10 minutes of a presentation just so you're more familiar with them and their work. Um, and in particular, um, be thinking about um, any, any tips you might like to glean from them um, from their experiences and how you might relate that to your work with your task force and then with your broader community, um, engaging with people, getting people to show up for events, public events you might be doing in the future, you know, hopefully post COVID times. Um, and, uh, and we'll take questions after all three have gone. So we'll do some Q and A after all three have, or all four, sorry, not all three. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then we'll do our breakout session. So let me introduce our special guests. Um, first up, we have Cedar Young, who is uh, involved with the, with the uh, Climate Smart Communities in Saranac Lake in upstate New York. Um, and Cedar, are you now in college? Is that right? Um, I'm a senior in high school. Senior, senior in high school. Okay, great. Um, and I first heard about Cedar through her work um, with Climate Smart Communities through um, that video that I shared with you all that Dazzle and the Climate Smart Communities program made. It's really spotlighting the youth movement um, as it relates to climate change. And so Cedar is um, the vice president of her environmental club and the founder and president of the Political Activism Club, working to educate students of all political viewpoints on issues affecting American youth. And in her community, Cedar has helped plan three Adirondack Youth Climate Summits and spoken at other summits across the state. So um, she's also a member of the Saranac Lake Climate Smart Communities Task Force um, and helped them gain bronze certification in September of 2020. Um, so Cedar, um, we're so happy to have you and um, we're really excited to hear more about the major role that, um, that youth are playing in climate change work. So um, why don't we have you go first and then we'll have Shaniqua, Brennan and Emily. Um, so you want me to present now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, just to check. I'm going to share my presentation. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So as Vanessa said, I am Cedar Young, senior at Saranac Lake High School. Um, I've been part of my school's environmental uh, club since sophomore year. Um, and I've worked with the youth climate program through like Wild Center and Tupper Lake. Um, I've planned summits, spoken across the state at different summits. Um, and uh, at my first youth climate summit, um, sophomore year 2018, I was first exposed to the Climate Smart Communities program through a session at the um, summit by Dazzle Ekblad of the uh, New York Department of Environmental Conservation. Seems like you guys know her. Um, and I was um, really blown away by the scope of the program. I was really interested in how specific and also um, comprehensive climate smart communities was on all aspects of climate change and um, what kind of it meant to become a climate smart community. 
the opportunities your town has once you receive certification and also um, the impact certification has on the future of your town or community. Um, so I was invited to join the Saranac Lake Climate Smart Community Task Force after that event as one of the youth representatives. And as, um, as my time progressed on the task force, um, we uh, took in more members and we've created a really special group of um, a really diverse organizationally uh, group of people across the Saranac Lake and Adirondack area, um, including our task force coordinator, Aaron Griffin, who works for the Wild Center, um, Kate Glenn and Crystal Giamara from Paul Smith and North Country Community Colleges. Um, we have Jamie Kinkowski and Cassandra Hopkins, who are both uh, government, uh, village government employees. Um, and then we have community members, Steve DeHaan, Becca Halter, Carolyn Costner, who all work with different groups like Sunrise, Tri Lakes 350, um, and also their own environmental uh, groups through working um, uh, through their jobs as well. Um, Harry Gordon, who is an architect through the US Green Building um, Group and uh, who was, a major player, especially when our task force went through our greenhouse gas inventory, which I'll touch on more later. Um, and lastly, there are Tucker and Jacoby and I, who are the Saranac Lake High School um, youth representatives to the task force. Um, and we are also in the process of training two more um, younger students to take our place when we graduate this year. So um, also, as was mentioned before, we were certified in September along with um, Shaniqua's Town of Homer. Um, and this was a really exciting uh, opportunity for Saranac Lake to um, finally get recognition for all the work we put in over the last three years um, through getting certified. Um, and it was also an important step for us in um, just showing our town and area that we are a leader in climate uh, in climate change work mitigation, um, as well as now we are working towards silver certification. Um, that's gonna take some time for sure, but we are well on our way. Um, we have 125 points um, with bronze certification only needing 120. Some of our actions um, uh, from the infrastructure section were um, HVAC and interior lighting upgrades to government buildings, um, Saranac Lake electric vehicle charging stations. Um, we have farmers markets every week um, throughout the whole year, whether they be inside or outside, um, residential organic waste programs, biking and walking infrastructure across the town. Um, we also have done work um, and a lot of actions in planning and policy with the smart growth policies and regulations, complete streets policy, making sure, again, that bikers and walkers are just as safe as those who are driving um, in our town. We've participated in Clean Energy Communities, CEC, um, which is another climate program that preceded Climate Smart Communities in New York. And through that program, we received points for unified solar permit, energy code enforcement, energy benchmarking for government buildings. And lastly, we created a giant um, hefty government greenhouse gas inventory for our town, which certainly took some time and a lot of effort from all the members of our task force. Um, but we were able to glean information about um, how much we were spending on certain um, certain energy sources and also what they emit in carbon. As you can see here, electricity is the most expensive uh, source that we use, but it is not the biggest polluter. It is um, the second biggest polluter. So it is something that our task force saw as um, something that we uh, need to work on cutting down electricity use in government buildings. Um, but also 
we were able to see how much fuel oil is really used by the government. And even though it's not necessarily even close to as expensive as electricity is for the town, how important it is still going to be to work to cut those emissions. Um, some of our actions were um, outreach related, which is especially where youth um, members, Tucker and I were involved. We run the social media. Um, our Instagram is climate smart SL. Uh, shameless plug, you should all go follow us right now. <laughs> Um, and we've been part of climate related public events, speaking at like Earth Day events and our, um, our certification event, uh, as well as helping with the Saranac Lake Climate Smart Communities website, which I have linked at the end of the presentation. Um, and the Safe Routes to School program, since Tucker and I are still part of the school system making sure that students that walk and bike to school are just as safe as those riding the bus or being driven in. Um, and also you were able to see at the beginning through our members um, how many partnerships we really have in our task force and how important that um, how inter intersectionally um, all these organizations have been to creating our task force and making sure that we have a full knowledge and um full voices from everyone in the uh climate uh climate movement so specifically youth and climate um as i have been a youth for my entire life um it's very important to me um to make sure that youth are a big voice in the climate movement um Recently in February, there was a youth focus group. I know Shaniqua was a part of this as well, um, where a handful of youth activists from across the state um, got together and spoke about um, the importance of youth in the climate movement and what kind of support they've received and what they would like to see from adults. Um, some of the ideas that were passed on were that youth are necessary, of course, because youth are the future. Um, not only just because we as youth are the ones that are going to uh, deal with the impacts of the climate uh, crisis, but also because youth are going to be the future lawyers, scientists, politicians that are tasked with continuing the fight against climate change um, and creating policies to make sure that not only um, climate change is mitigated, but the effects are also going to be mitigated and um, everyone will still live as normal a life as possible. Um, you have special skills like um, like internet outreach, like Tucker and I running our social media, as well as just kind of knowing like trends and what's on the top of people's mind at any moment. Um, but also getting other youth involved through that connection with local schools and clubs and youth groups um, like the Sarnic Lake High Schools, uh, Green Storm Environmental Club, um, and like Youth Climate Program. Also, along with like bigger groups like Sunrise that are more intergenerational. Um, we spoke about supporting youth and some of the biggest ideas were that adults need to make sure that they check in with youth um, and make sure that they understand. I know when I first started on the task force, one of the most difficult things for me was understanding all the government lingo that was being thrown around by um, older members and government um, employees. And so it was really important to have um, adults that we could check in with and make sure that we understood and ask questions to um, make sure you don't overlook or underestimate the power of youth. Um, and also, as adults, I'm sure you all know how frustrating it is to have someone take over a project that you're working on, but especially for youth, um, it's kind of, it's demeaning almost, and it feels like you're not being trusted as much as an adult when adults take over projects that you're working on. So make sure that you give youth the space to work on their own um, ideas, uh, projects without um, interloping in their uh, workings. 
Um, and also, of course, make sure you listen to the ideas of youth because the youth voice and perspective is really important to the climate movement as a whole. So if you have any questions about this um, beyond our session today, you can reach me at my email here, cedaryoung1 at gmail.com. Or if you have more technical questions about the task force, our coordinator, Aaron Griffin's email is egriffin at wildcenter.org. And again, shameless plug, make sure you follow us on Instagram. It's climatesmartsl so you can see our progress and get ideas, check in with us um, if you have any questions about our uh, programs and actions completed so far. And lastly, our uh, website at serenecklakeny.gov um, down at Green Initiatives is the Climate Smart page where you can find um, meeting links for our meetings every Wednesday um, at 4 p.m. or every first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cedar. That was awesome. And um, yes, also want to reiterate to follow Saranac Lake's Climate Smart community on social media because our next session um, for the for our local champions here will be getting into social media and websites and such. So um, good to get started and check out what they're doing. Um, thank you so much, Cedar. Okay, so next up we have Shaniqua Perry, who is um, located in the village of Homer, New York. Um, again, a bit north of us here. Um, and Shaniqua is someone that I also discovered through that, that video um, because uh, the youth in Homer actually went to their mayor and, and said, hey, we want Homer to be doing this Climate Smart Communities program. And the mayor said, okay, well, how about you lead the charge? And um, I think, that that's super impressive and um, just a, a really interesting model for how to put youth at the forefront of, of the action. So um, Shaniqua is the CSC task force coordinator for the village of Homer. So um, she's wearing that same hat that all of you, our local champions are wearing. Um, and um, she's doing all the things like keeping the meetings going and recruiting members and keeping everything on track. Um, she's, she's now graduated from high school and is, um, and is working on her degree in environmental biology from SUNY. And, um, and then she's also still working on Climate Smart. Um, and fun fact, and her extra time, she works with wolves at a local sanctuary. So Shaniqua, please step on up and take uh, take the spotlight. All righty. Um, so hi, I'm Shaniqua. As she said, I am a student at SUNY ESF studying environmental biology. I will be graduating next spring. Um, and I am the village coordinator for the climate task force. If you want to um, contact me with any questions, that's my email. Um, I check it constantly. <laughs> um, so my story really began in high school. That's where I got my start. Um, I became an officer of the environmental club there. And we started a lot of projects while I was there, including um, a garden and a solar charging station on campus. Um, and then once we kind of got that out of the way, we did projects on school where we wanted to expand. Um, so I'm pretty sure we found out about Climate Smart Communities at the same summit Cedar did. Um, Andrew went to that same session, I think. Um, and he got really excited about it and he told the rest of our team about it. And we all got super excited about it. And as soon as we got um, back to the hotel, I'm pretty sure we sent an email to the mayor asking if we could get involved. Um, um, we had him come to our school just to give him a tour of what we had done and kind of um, introduce him to us. And then we asked him how we could help with Climate Smart Communities. So we met a couple weeks later with the Board of Trustees and the mayor, and they basically handed the task force over to us, which was great, um, but also a lot of work. Um, 
So um, from there, we, I think that was like two years ago or something like that. Um, I took over as the coordinator at that point. We hadn't, all I had done at that point was register. So uh, we helped them form the task force and now we run those meetings and we helped get them um, certified. So I am the coordinator and then Andrew um, is my assistant coordinator. He's very helpful. Um, but we led the charge. We run the meetings together. We send emails. We get um, documentation together. We were lucky and fortunate that Homer had done most of the actions we needed for bronze already. So most of what we've been doing for the past couple of years is just compiling all of those and putting them um, on the, the portal and getting them ready. So last summer, I, um, I had a paid internship with the village, which allowed me to devote my time to collecting all the random documentation and figuring out how um, to do that stuff. Um, I did a lot of writing policy, doing inventories um, and stuff like that. But what really helped us um, move forward was our partnership with SUNY ESF, um, which we had before I before I decided to come here um, for school. Um, so we partnered with a class up here, um, environmental auditing. Um, so they did our community greenhouse gas inventory and our government operations greenhouse gas inventory. And that that took a lot of the really technical things off of our back and put that on them, um, which that's the class is devoted to teaching them how to do that. Um, so that partnership has been instrumental in moving us forward and we are continuing to partner with them. Um, currently coming up with some internships for college students to get some of our bigger things done um, that the village does not have the resources to do themselves. Um, and that's the main reason why we were so helpful in getting them to this point is that they just didn't have the time, the people or the capacity to, to get this documentation together. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much our journey. All right. Thank you so much, Shaniqua. Amazing. All right. So next up we have Brendan Kearney. Um, actually a neighbor of mine in Rhinebeck. And Brennan um, is in fact a, uh, a county legislator here in Dutchess County. Um, so she has that firsthand experience um, working in government. She also was on the town board here in Rhinebeck. Um, so just a wonderful resource in that respect. But today we're actually invited Brennan to speak to us about Repair cafes. Um, repair cafes um, are a really unique hands on opportunity. Um, and uh, just recently, just this fall, um, they became an action that you can get points for with Climate Smart Community. So we thought it'd be a really fun example of a way to work with your, with your local community and get points towards your certification. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention um, we we were so uh, we were so saddened by John Wackman's passing. So John Wackman really was the man who started repair cafes in the Hudson Valley. Um, longtime environmental activist and, and community organizer, just an amazing person. Um, and he was he was going to join us today for this session and talk to you all about repair cafes, but he suddenly very tragically died um, just earlier this year. So we dedicate this session to John's memory and um, you know, carry on his spirit in working with the community. Um, and so, yeah, no, no small shoes for, for Brennan to fill today, big shoes to fill. Um, but uh, Brennan, please, I'd like to invite you up to tell us a bit about repair cafe. I'm going to disappoint you all terribly with my complete lack of anything except this picture of my face, um, because I have no idea how to make those awesome things uh, that uh, folks younger than I am uh, showed you. Um, 
So yeah, I'm um, I'm the county legislator for Rhinebeck and Clinton, but my participation um, in repair in the repair cafe movement um, began uh, because it's something I personally care about, um, and I'm really committed to repairing things. Um, I'm really really pleased that it's been added um, to the certification list um, because when I was making notes about what to speak with you, I said, you know, what is the problem that this group um, was, I, what problem identified that the group is meant to address? And it's really consumer waste, right? Um, so if you, if you close your eyes, and probably try to list all of the devices or gadgets or even um, pieces of furniture in the room you're in, if you had your eyes closed, you might not be able to complete that all of us are throwing away um, an incredible number of these items, um, partly because of planned obsolescence. Um, it's not possible to fix some of the items we get, but also because the culture of repair has been in decline. Um, in 2009, um, a woman named Martine Postequin, um founded uh, the first uh, international uh, repair cafe in Amsterdam. And since that time, um, they've grown to over 1,533 countries. Um, we're very lucky, uh, particularly in the Hudson Valley region here, um, where I serve in New York, um, to have several operating groups. Um, so again, if you closed your eyes, so you don't have to look at me all the time, um, I would like to describe for you our repair cafe room in Rhinebeck. Um, so you can imagine a welder, a massage therapist, um, two to three sewing machines set up um, with skilled operators at the ready, um, several people um, with a collection of tools, including knife sharpening tools, carpentry tools, electrical tools. Um, and then you could imagine um, the line of people waiting to get in. We don't always have a line, um, but frequently we do. Um, and they would be carrying radios, lamps, chairs, vacuums, bicycles, um, any manner of clothing, um, any manner of item that needs um, and the way, a, the way a repair cafe is organized, um, you are trying to build a community of people who can offer a variety of skills. And those people, we meet four times a year. Um, those people don't have to be available at every um, session. Um, you know, as you, as you publicize meetings, um, you, you might alter the list of what you um, plan to have available. Um, I would also always be requesting volunteers um, because people, uh, I still find that people don't know about these. And so they get very excited um, when they hear that there's a place, one where they can get their items fixed, but other people are very, very eager to share their skills. Um, and, uh, um, I wish I could take credit for find, founding the Rhinebeck Repair Cafe. Um, but um, that was actually done um, in, I believe, 2014. Um, and it is oh, just a core group of people. Um, and it is promoted largely through social media. Um, and there's also a physical sign that we put out when the repair cafe is open. So that um, sort of signals to the community um, to come on in. And um, well, again, yeah, they've been open for you know, six, to, six to eight um, repairs. Sometimes there's that line at the front, and we usually have a greeter who um, tells you who, who you are waiting for. Um, and uh, typically, we run the cafe from 12 to 4 p.m. Um, I think it would be exciting to see um, communities that could, that could 
host, you know, for even more more time or more events than we do. Um, and this goes without saying, we have been shut down during COVID. Um, so I don't have really great uh, suggestions for you in that um, regard. But um, I think well, in the breakout room, you're welcome to ask me any questions. But um, I, I wanted to, to say that um, the power in in the room that you feel during a repair cafe is um, very strong. Um, you usually find yourself in a group of people who share um, a similar commitment to reducing um, consumer waste and um, you know trying to keep the life of our items um, going for us. Um, and you know they, 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 uh, our group tends to be um, extraordinarily smart and committed and interested. Um, you also touching interaction with the public, um, depending who you're helping. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've had everything from uh, teenagers uh, needing something repaired um, to parents with bicycles to old older uh, women with vacuums. Um, just a group, an extraordinary um, range of need. Um, which, you know, I guess probably shows you the range of the problem and also the, the variety of people we're reaching with the message that you don't have to throw things away and that here is a way where your community is supporting you free of cost in continuing the life of your vacuum or your grandmother's chair. Um, the sewing uh, ladies do um, speci the special type of um, Japanese repair that's become very um, popular um, where you actually celebrate the nature of the repair to the fabric. So you see um, that repair work, that's something really exciting that they do, but you know, they can also sew a seam. Um, so again, as these, as these items get repaired, uh, it's a very pal palpable experience. Um, I, uh, it's like it's like going to um, you know religious service for the for the recyclers of the world um, be among your people. Um, so again, looking forward to the breakout rooms. Happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you so much, Brennan. Um, yes, and I can attest to that energy in the room. And um, for those of you who are interested in checking one of these out, stay tuned to repaircafehv.org because um, that's where they list um, all of the towns that have these across the Hudson Valley. And you don't have to be from that town in order to attend. Um, so that might be a way for you to test the waters. Um, also, these are, you know, Brennan mentioned, this is free of charge. And I think that's something that um, is, is just, it's, you know, everyone is welcome and um, and there's no barrier to entry for this sort of experience. So it's a great thing to offer to your community. Um, and also if you go on that website, you can see um, some of the photos from these events just to get a sense of it. Um, so thank you, Brennan. Um, okay, so last but not least, we have Emily Vale, who is the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Um, I first met Emily because she was co-facilitating a vulnerability workshop with the Nature Conservancy. So one of the uh, many uh, things that she does with, with municipalities. Um, and she's been the executive director since 2019. Um, and she also served for eight years at the New York State DEC um, Hudson River Estuary Program. So uh, another group that we, we know well and love. Um, and she has really done a lot of work com with communities all around the issue of protecting our water and our ecosystem as it relates to water in the Hudson Valley. Um, I thought she'd be really interesting to talk to the group because she's not only about, um, you know, the community work around watersheds, but bringing different watershed groups together to learn from each other. 
Um, and I, I just think watershed watersheds is such a, um, a beautiful way of thinking about how we are all indeed interconnected. Um, so with that, I would love Emily to step into the spotlight. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen, but while I'm doing this, I just wanna do like a Zoom self-care check-in, like maybe look away from your screen and rest your eyes, maybe roll your shoulders back if you've been sitting at a computer hunched over like me all day, like maybe a deep breath. Yes, okay, great. Where's your cat? Your cat made an appearance at your last presentation. Oh my God, do you wanna know where That would be a good cleanse for me. My cat is right here. Can you see her? She's up on the shelf. No, deciding over everything she's yeah she's oh, not she's gonna scared. walk back and forth this time. i was wondering if y'all could see her uh giving herself a bath um <laughs> that was distracting uh yeah the cat is always present um okay so i'm really thrilled to be here i think that what you all are doing is really amazing work and um a lot of I'm getting a lot of inspiration from hearing the other speakers and seeing how these communities are learning from each other and working together as a cohort, like Vanessa said, really very much in line with what we do to bring groups together, sharing strategies, sharing best practices. Um, so I'm gonna to talk today about watershed collaborations. And just so we're all on the same page, a watershed is the land area where water flows to a specific water body. When it rains, uh, that water will collect and flow to a particular common water body through streams, through groundwater. We talk a lot about tributaries, which are smaller streams that flow into a larger river. And these watershed areas are defined by topography most of the time, but not exclusively. So we know that there are places where things get complicated and pipes underground bring water in unexpected places. But basically when we're talking about watersheds, we're talking about both the land and the water that contribute to water quality in a particular area downstream. So the Hudson River watershed is over 13,000 square miles. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance covers this whole area, believe it or not, with one staff person. And uh, But we really rely on our connections with the local groups that are really on the ground, that know their conditions, that can really be working, you know, taking these smaller parts, working together to make the whole uh, a more healthy ecosystem, healthier for our communities here. So we can divide our, our area up into these three really big watersheds, the Upper Hudson and the Adirondacks. I just checked Saranac Lake is outside of our watershed. I actually wasn't sure. Um, the Mohawk River watershed and the Hudson River estuary. But then each tributary has its own watershed. So we can start to scale down from this really big picture to the more local. So watersheds are a geographic unit that we can use to understand conditions and manage water bodies, and they rarely align with municipal boundaries. And I think this is really important as we're thinking about climate smart communities, which is really so geared towards municipal scale actions. There are now a number of actions in climate smart communities that are watershed based, which is great. And I think this poses both opportunities and challenges. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. But uh, again, the land use, the activities that are taking place within the watershed are impacting the waters downstream. So the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is a regional organization. We work to support our local watershed groups and our, our local partners. We improve intermunicipal coordination by helping municipalities work together on complicated water issues. And we also work to communicate as a collective voice. We do a lot of programs and uh, that are education and capacity building. This is a screenshot from our conference last fall. So when I'm talking about watershed groups, what we're talking about here are really community-based initiatives that take on a variety of different forms. Many of them are volunteer run. We have some that are intermunicipal councils where municipalities each have a representative that participates in that council. Some are led by agencies or nonprofits. And in general, these watershed groups have strong local knowledge of the watershed. They're advocating for its health in a variety of different ways. And they're collaborating with a number of other groups, both local and then regional state and so on. The kinds of things that watershed groups do differ. Each watershed group is different. Each watershed has different concerns. Municipalities, communities have different priorities. But in general, the kinds of actions that they take are things like convening stakeholders, coordinating projects, educating residents, promoting stewardship like cleanups or planting trees, monitoring water quality, 
partnering on research projects and creating watershed plans. So we consider watershed groups sort of the core constituency of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. We have lots of different partners, but a lot of what we, we're doing is really focused on making sure our watershed groups have the tools, the, the information that they need to be successful. So I'm gonna shift quickly to climate smart communities and some of the opportunities that are in the new, the, the most recent round uh, in terms of watersheds and water quality. So. There are some new actions in pledge element seven in particular, like flood mitigation plans with hydrologic and hydraulic assessments. I've got links here to examples that were done in the Sawkill watershed and the Moodna Creek watershed um, that would meet the requirements of this. I don't think they've been submitted by their communities for these points yet, but this is a real opportunity. Uh, also note that the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is funding a number of these plans in the coming years. And so that's also an opportunity for communities to get points for work that is going on at a watershed scale. But if it's including your municipality, this is a great opportunity. So that's on the flooding side. In terms of water quality, watershed characterizations and watershed plans that focus on water quality can also now be submitted for points. Um, the Quasea Creek Watershed Management Plan is a great example. That's the one that I always point to. Again, they haven't submitted it for points, but uh, it's a really great model of compiling information about water quality and the watershed, identifying actions to take to improve conditions. Um, so just. It's a really great case study. Drinking water source protection is also really important. Um, source water protection is now being supported by a number of state agencies through the DWSP2 program. And again, there are some uh, projects that are ongoing that are using that framework in municipalities to identify threats and opportunities to protect drinking water sources. Another action might be vulnerability assessments to analyze and prioritize climate hazards and risks like community resilience building workshops. Uh, that's where I met Vanessa. We did the community resilience building workshop for town and village of Rhinebeck, town and village of Red Hook. This photo is one we did with lower Wappinger Creek communities. So bringing them all together and identifying these shared risks, but also uh, assets that need to be protected. There's a number of other actions that relate to water in Pledge Element 7. Watershed groups are very active with the Trees for Tribs program, which provides trees and shrubs to plant alongside streams. You can use that for the riparian buffer Pledge Element. Nature-based shorelines, perhaps less so, but similar to, to planting riparian buffers. Green infrastructure projects for stormwater management, culverts and dams conserving natural areas. Many groups are in partnership with land trusts that may be preserving natural areas and then water conservation and reuse. I think in particular, the groups down in Rockland County are very active with this given some of the issues of water quantity and availability of drinking water in Rockland County. But certainly this is something that watershed groups may be thinking about. So, I encourage you all to find your local group. I did that for you. <laughs> um, so some of you- uh, Amazing, that was gonna be one of my questions. Thank you. I know, <laughs> it's just, I know the map, so I just made it easier for you. Um, we've got Town of Northeast, you're in the 10 Mile River Watershed, which is sponsored by the Housatonic Valley Association, it's a little bit in the Rojan. We've got Copake and Germantown, of course, in the Rojan, which is the Rojan Watershed Community. Rochester, we know you're in the Rondout. Uh, Hurley, you've got a little sliver in the Rondout, but also the Esopus Creek. You probably know that there's a lot going on in the Esopus Creek right now. I'm very happy to talk with you more. There used to be a very active watershed group and there's a lot going on in the Esopus. Um, Union Vale, Jen, you are in the fish kill, which you probably know. And I wanted to mention that I've been in touch with the supervisor at the town of Wappinger, who is very interested in doing a Sprout Creek watershed initiative of some kind. So even though the fish kill watershed group is not active right now, um, there's some real interest in getting stakeholders together and looking at the Sprout Creek and there might be opportunities there. Okay, so my recommendations for watershed collaborations and community engagement is to check in with what your watershed groups are working on. They may be working on Climate Smart Community Pledge elements where you may be able to partner with them and take advantage and take credit and get 
at the points through their work. There are probably places where goals are aligned. So even if they're not currently working on a project, that might be something that they have planned down the road. Um, and I think that it's it'll be important to leverage watershed group and municipal strengths in particular with watershed groups, the local knowledge that they bring about the water resources, their education programs that they provide. They are doing a lot of work to reach community members and educate them on water quality and, and quantity, and also the networks that they've built. Again, the networks in between different watershed groups, local, and then on up to higher level county, region, state. Um, I also wanted to echo something that Cedar said that I just think is so important, um, which is to check in for comprehension, but importantly, to not discount the value of their perspectives if they don't know certain things. I think that can be a real barrier for community engagement at all different levels where you throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, like, oh, they don't even know X, Y, Z. How can they possibly be? bring anything important to bear. And that is such a harmful perspective. I think it's really important to recognize that everyone's got their own experience, everyone's got their own lens, and that you know groups may not be familiar with something, but they have something really important to offer. So just um, you know, highlighting Cedar's advice, just a really important community engagement best practice. So watershed groups are also working on community engagement. They also want to know what our local priorities are, what groups, other groups, community focus groups are working on. They're trying to get information out to people. Everyone lives in a watershed, everyone works in a watershed. And so there may be opportunities to partner on educational initiatives or other types of pro projects. This photo is from a big community engagement project I did on the Tannery Brook in Kingston, highlighting the there's a stream underneath that parking lot that's contributing to flooding and infrastructure damage and getting the community to really recognize the impact of that. I also wanted to say that uh, if watershed initiatives include multiple municipalities, there may be opportunities for several to get points. So just even looking at the Rojan, which is a very large watershed, you know, if the Rojan watershed community is doing something that's watershed wide, there might be opportunities for both Copake and Germantown to get points for that. It is based on the percentage of the community that's within the watershed. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, very excited to be talking with you all in breakout rooms and about ideas for next steps. Hopefully amazing. that was <laughs> that was That was amazing. Thank you so much, Emily.